Okay, so welcome to this final video uh, on the electron transport chain. In this video, what we want to talk about is uh, the ATP synthase. So we've seen now how complex 1, complex 2, and complex... Uh, sorry, no, uh, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4 are involved in the electron transport chain, and how uh, they are involved in the moving of protons from the matrix of the mitochondria into uh, the intermembrane space. This then builds up a significant uh, proton concentration gradient across the inner membrane of the mitochondria, where you have a much higher proton concentration in the intermembrane space than you do uh, within the matrix. Let's just draw a little picture of this. So if we've got our mitochondrion here, okay, here's the outer membrane, here's the inner membrane, with the uh, invaginations inwards known as the cristae, Okay, you have a much higher proton concentration in the intermembrane space than you do within the matrix. The matrix concentration is much smaller. In addition, the electrical gradient across this membrane is around negative 160 millivolts, meaning that the electrical potential of the matrix of the mitochondria is around 160 millivolts lower than the electrical potential within the intermembrane space. Okay, so there is a significant um, force pulling the protons back into uh, the matrix, okay, and this is called the proton motive force, okay, and basically wherever there's a force there is potential for energy to be expended, so what's going to happen is there is an enzyme, well, a huge great protein complex, which is within the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And this basically is the only means by which protons are allowed to move from the intermembrane space back into the matrix. And when they do, they release a large amount of energy in going down the electrical potential gradient. So when they go down the electrical potential gradient, they release uh, electrical potential energy. And that electrical potential energy is going to be used by the ATP synthase to bind ADP to inorganic phosphate to create ATP, hence why it is called ATP synthase. And I don't know why I've called it an ATPase. Okay, this is ATP synthase. Now, ATP synthase is sometimes also called complex 5. Okay, now it has an absolutely fantastic structure which I'm going to draw out for you now. So, if this is the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria here, so basically what you have is a large pore. So, I'll try and draw this here. So, it's a large tube made up of loads of proteins known as C proteins. Okay, and it's usually between 8 and 15 of these. Whoops. Okay, so this is a massive great pore through which protons can move. Okay, so... I'll try and draw the separate C subunits, so maybe we'll go for 10, maybe. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but basically this can vary between 8 and 15, so I've just gone for 10 because that's a nice number between 8 and 15. So this is either 8 C units or 15, so it's called C8 to C15. Okay, and this is the pore through which the protons are going to move. Okay, now let me just colour this in. So we'll have the C subunits in blue here. Okay, so this is an individual C subunit that I am uh, colouring in blue now. Okay, and I don't think I'll colour the entire thing in. Maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll outline it in blue, so maybe colour this portion in blue and this portion in blue here. There we go, it's outlined in blue. Okay, now, uh, that's not all there is to ATP synthase. That's just one little bit of it. Basically, next to it we then have another portion known as the A subunit. Okay, and then we have a fantastic portion which I won't draw yet. I'm going to firstly draw another portion. Okay, so I'll split this up into the F0 and the F1 portions in a moment. I'm just going to draw the full thing and then I'll explain which bits are F1 and which bits are F0. Okay, so this portion that I'm drawing here is called gamma. And this basically is a pole that extends between this tube here 
uh, which is the pore through which the protons are going to move, and the portion that's actually going to synthesize uh, the ATP, which is over here. Okay, so down here then, there is a fantastic portion, which is basically um, a um, circular disk containing six separate proteins, and I'll show you this in more detail in a moment. Okay, and then sitting on top of this, up here, is a portion known as the delta portion. Okay, and now there is this portion that I'll show you here. So basically, there is a final portion known as the B2 portion, which extends all the way from the A portion over here uh, up to the top of the delta portion here, and this is B2. So let's colour in all of these separate portions in a different colour. So we have A, which we'll colour in in vivid pink here. Okay. Uh, we have B2, uh, which we'll colour in in turquoise here. So this is B2, like so, stretching around here. Okay. Then we have delta, uh, which will be in yellow down here. Okay, so that's delta. And now this portion in the middle, which I just want to talk about separately. So I haven't really drawn it here, but if we now looked from a different aspect, so if we looked down, imagine we're sort of stuck to gamma and we're looking down, what would we see? We'd see a circle like so. And it would basically have the gamma bit here, so here's the gamma bit, and gamma would go through the middle of it. Okay, so there's the gamma in the middle, and let me just see if I can colour that in a little bit more precisely. Okay, and then it consists of six proteins around gamma, like so, split up, taking up around 120, oh sorry, 60 degrees each. Okay, so, basically, three of these are what are known as alpha proteins, and this should be another alpha protein, not a beta one. So, three alphas, and then in between them, three beta proteins, like so. So let's colour in the betas and the alphas in separate colours. So we'll have beta in bright green, okay, so we have three beta subunits, one, two, three, okay, and then we have also three alpha subunits here in red. Now this uh, portion consisting of these three alpha and three beta subunits. This is the portion which is actually going to be responsible for the synthesis of ATP. Okay, so we'll firstly just divide it up into the F0 and the F1 uh, portions, and then we'll talk about how, um, how we're actually going to synthesize ATP. So, all the bits which have been given normal Latin letters, those are considered the F0 portion. So this C8, C15 pore here, this is part of F0. The A portion is part of F0. B2 is part of F0. And I've just realised I've made a rather hideous mistake. I've missed one little portion off, a rather trivial portion, uh, as far as this picture is concerned, but a portion nonetheless. And this is the epsilon portion here, Okay, which just sort of sits at the base of gamma over there. Okay, so... All of these Latin portions uh, are F0, so A, B2, and all of the Cs, those are F0. Now, all of the bits which use the Greek alphabet, so alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, that is the F1 portion. So F1, uh, all of the F1 portion is enabled by Greek letters, and all of the F0 portion is enabled by Latin letters. Okay, so this whole thing then is the ATP synthase enzyme. Now, how does this actually synthesize ATP? Well, basically, when protons move through, and basically to drive this, free protons need to move through. So when free protons move through this um, pore, from the intermembrane space into the matrix, what's going to happen is the whole thing rotates, and this alpha-beta portion rotates, okay? So it's rotating round, and it will rotate round 120 degrees, so this alpha portion will go to where this alpha portion is here, this alpha portion will go to where this alpha one is here, and this alpha one will go up to here. Now the alpha ones aren't the ones which are actually important for ATP synthesis, 
the beta ones are the ones which are important for uh, ATP synthesis. So let me explain the cycle that happens. So basically, one of these beta uh, pieces will be in the stage of binding ADP and inorganic phosphate. So let's say, uh, whoops, ADP and inorganic phosphate. So let's say this beta portion here is in the stage where it binds to ADP and inorganic phosphate. And the stage when you bind ADP and inorganic phosphate is known as the beta ADP stage. So this one is in the beta ADP stage. Okay, so uh, I will color code it. So we'll have coded in orange here. This one here is currently in the beta ADP stage. Okay, now let's say this one then is in the beta ATP stage. So what happens basically is when it's in this position, the ADP and inorganic phosphate come in and bind here. Then when the whole thing rotates around, this beta subunit here ends up where this one is positioned here. And when it's in that position, what happens is the ADP and the phosphate are rammed together to make an ATP molecule. So this beta subunit will have ATP bound to it. And it's then said to be in the beta ATP state. So when you have ATP bound, you're in the beta ATP state. Then what will happen is another three protons will come through and this will go round into this one here now, so it will move round again another 120 degrees, and here what will happen is the ATP will fall out, and this is called the beta empty state. Okay, so then what will happen is it will go round again, it will go into this state here, and uh, it will get ADP and inorganic phosphate bound to it, and then it will move round again. But of course the reality is, this is occurring continuously, so it's not just as though one is having this occur to it, it's happening to all of them at the same time, so all of them will be in one of these states. So basically, if we say this one currently has ADP and inorganic phosphate bound to it, this one currently has ATP bound to it, and this one's currently empty, then when three protons move along, it will spin around, the ATP will then fall out because this one's moved into this slot here, so the ATP that was bound to it falls out. The empty one moves into this slot here and therefore gets ADP and inorganic phosphate binding to it, and the one that was originally in this slot here, uh, where ADP and inorganic phosphate had bound to it, will then move around again into the beta ATP slot, and the ADP and the inorganic phosphate will be bound together to create ATP. And that process goes round and round and round and round, and thereby uh, binds ADP and inorganic phosphate to create ATP. Okay, and every uh, round of that requires free protons. So to rotate it round um, 120 degrees, that requires free protons. Okay, uh, now basically free protons are therefore equivalent to one ATP molecule being synthesized. And you might say, hang on a second, surely it's uh, nine protons, because to create a molecule of ATP, you have to go around in a full cycle, surely. Okay, but remember, all of them are doing it at the same time. So if we actually go around in a full cycle, at the end of that, we won't have created one molecule of ATP. We will have created three molecules of ATP, and therefore, three uh, nine protons take us round in the full cycle to create three molecules of ATP, therefore it's three mo uh, protons to one molecule of ATP. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the electron transport chain.